Welcome again to the Simple Bible Study Podcast. I am your host, the Bible Guy. My mission, teach the Bible in the most basic and the most simple way possible to anyone and everyone willing to listen, wanting to learn, wanting to grow in the Word of God. Are you going to get the deepest study here or the most learned or the 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 the, the most uh, in-depth? Probably not. My endeavor and my assignment from the Spirit of God is to go through the Word of God, each book and each chapter at a time, in the most simple and the most basic way possible. I know some really great and deep Bible teachers, and if you'll email me, I can send you a list of some folks that will break down the Greek and break down the Hebrew and go into more systematic theology than I could ever hope to do. But my goal is to reach that new believer or that believer who's kind of fallen off from Bible study a bit, who wants to just kind of pick up uh, at a very uh, slow pace, uh, taking in a little at a time. And so that's what we're here to do. That's my assignment from the Holy Spirit. I hope it's a blessing to you. It certainly is for me. Uh, You know, when you teach the Word of God, it encourages you to study the Word of God even more. You better know what you're talking about uh, when you get on something like this. So I thank you for joining us. We're starting again at Matthew, the third chapter, and we're picking up at the 13th verse. And so as you get your Bibles, I'm going to pray us in and we'll go from there. Lord, we thank you for this awesome opportunity to go ahead and teach your word to anybody and everybody willing to listen and willing to grow in your word. If they're listening now, it's because they have an interest. It's because they have a desire to grow in the word of God. And so, God, we thank you for this opportunity. We pray it all for anyone listening to me. You know their needs. You know their desires. You know what they have uh, a hope for, Lord. We pray that you answer all their prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. The 13th chapter, we've now we've now come to the place where this John the Baptist, who we found to be an awesome preacher, an awesome example for us, an awesome example for those who may be going into ministry, uh, an example of speaking the truth no matter to no matter who it is, no matter how high their position, an example of not allowing race to cloud your judgment. John said, don't say you have Abraham. Don't say you're a Jew. God is able to raise up stones as children to Abraham. Uh, there's a lot of uh, racial tension in our culture and society right now. And there's a lot of temptation of uh, on uh, some of us who are a part of what we call oppressed uh, communities to begin to identify racially. But let me tell you something. God is not so much concerned about your race. Oh, he made you your race and he made you your race on purpose. But what he's really concerned about is your faith in Christ. And I don't care what race you are. If you have faith in Christ, you're my brother. And so we can take those examples from John. And so now we come to the ultimate reason for John's being in the scripture, and that is his meeting Jesus and coming to introduce him to us via baptism. Verse 13, then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Now, we already explained in an earlier study that baptism is the whelming or overwhelming, the 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 overcoming of uh, of water over a person being being um, well, I guess you could say dunked into water. Uh, John also said that Jesus would w- overwhelm or baptize with the Holy Ghost as well. And so uh, Jesus came to, from Galilee to Jordan unto John. I'm sorry, to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him, but John forbade him, saying, "I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me?" And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered or allowed him. Jesus had no sin. He had nothing to repent of. He was the perfect man. But he had to come in and experience what man experiences. In Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, it says he was numbered with the transgressors. That's us. And so he was amongst us. He, he, he experienced all that we experienced. The book of Hebrews will tell us uh, that he was, he, he was in like, wise, in like manner tempted. Uh, actually, let's go there before I misquote it. Let's turn to Hebrews, the second chapter, 
And the 17th verse says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor or rescue them that are tempted. And so Jesus became one of us. He wasn't uh, he wasn't God in a man mask. Uh, he was fully God and fully man. And I know there'll be people who disagree with that, but uh, he 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 definitely was not. It, it would not be fair to say that he was he he knows what I experienced when he was just simply God wearing a man mask. No, he was fully man. He experienced the things that we experienced. And so that's why he can say, John, we have to baptize me so that it will fulfill all righteousness, so that it would be, it is the right thing to do so that I could experience what man experiences. And so, um, you know, when we when we discuss the the dual nature of Christ, the what they call the hypostatic union, that's a big word. It just talks about the the uniting of the 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 deity of Christ and the humanity of Christ. Basically, it's summed up there in, in the book of Timothy. Actually, First Timothy, the uh, second chapter. And the 16th verse, this is one of those things that is debated again throughout throughout church history. Christians have have tried to uh, debate. Actually, pe- actually, if you don't hold the, to the deity of Christ, you cannot rightfully call yourself a Christian. But uh, it's it's solved here. Second chapter of Second Timothy, the 16th verse. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. The deity of the man, uh, the deity of Christ and the humanity of Christ. Christ was fully man and experienced those things that man experienced. Verse 16, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight out of straightway out of the water. Straightway means immediately. We'll see that. Uh, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so we jump right into another controversy, the Trinity. People will, people have debated the Trinity um, uh, throughout the millennia as well. And I said in a previous uh, podcast that I am indeed what you call a Trinitarian. I believe in the, the idea that there is one God eternally existed in three persons, not three gods, but one God uh, existed in three persons. And here is one of our favorite verses. We Trinitarians, we have it here. We have here present the son, Jesus being baptized. We have the spirit of God, the Holy Ghost descending like a dove. And we have the voice from heaven saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. The Bible says at Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter in the fourth verse, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And so the, the Trinitarian, the, the, the person who believes in the Trinity, has no problem with the idea that there is one God. As I said, there is one God. Uh, but we have a bit of a problem. If you hold to all of Scripture, you have to answer uh, who is the one God. Uh, there is a person who is called the Father. And at first Peter, the first chapter, he's called God. Let's read. Peter says uh, of the people of the church that they are elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the father. Well, the father is the one God. Okay. But then again, at Acts, the fifth chapter, there's a person called the Holy Ghost. And it says there at the third verse, when a man named Ananias had lied to God, Uh, about how much he had given the church. Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not thine own? After it was sold, was it not thine in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, 
but unto God. And so there's a person called the Holy Ghost, and he's God. And then, in just in one of several places, there's a person called the Word, and he's God. John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see, one God, but there are three persons called the one God. Well, who raised Jesus from the dead? Let's look at 1 Peter again, chapter 1, the third chapter. I'm sorry, the third verse. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There's the Father raising the Son from the dead. But then at Romans, the eighth chapter, the 11th verse says, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Well, there's a person called the spirit who raised up Jesus from the dead. But at St. John, the second chapter in the 19th verse, it says, Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up again. And at the 21st verse, he says, it says, but he spake of the temple of his body. So he was speaking of the resurrection. So we have a person called the father who raised Jesus from the dead. We have a person called the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. And we have a person called the word who raised Jesus from the dead. Well, who raised Jesus from the dead? Well, it acts the second chapter. And the 32nd verse, it says, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Who created man and who created the world? Well, at Psalms, the 102nd chapter says that the Lord created the world, or Jehovah, who we believe to be the Father. Well, in John, the first chapter and the third verse, St. John, that is, says all things were made by him, the son or the word. And without him was not anything made that was made. In Job, the 33rd chapter in the fourth verse says the spirit of God hath made me. The breath of the almighty hath given me life. Who created everything? God did. The father, the son, the spirit. And there's so much more, so many more scriptures. The key to understanding the, the understanding the nature of God is to take all of scripture and make and, and, and make them all fit together. Any other view, whether it be what's called the Arian view, which makes Jesus merely a, the first created creature of God, uh, or the uh, what's called the the oneness uh, view or the modalistic view, which says that, uh, you know, uh, God is is one person, uh, but he has three offices. And so he transforms into the son and then into the spirit. All of these views have to ignore uh, much of scripture, ignore or change much of scripture. It is the Trinity that attempts to take all of what scripture says about God and and form an idea. You don't like the word Trinity. It's not in the Bible. They said, okay, fine. Let's go with Godhead. That's in the Bible. Uh, the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Three persons, but one God. We thank you for joining us and we pray your blessing. We pray that this was a blessing to you and that you'll join us next time as we go to the fourth chapter of the book of St. Matthew. God bless you.